And also, um, Daphna Baran is going to come. She's, she's a well-known stand-up comic of <laughs> And she's going to contribute as well to this one. <laughs> I think it works. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Daphne Graham. Uh, I'm a stand-up comedian. I too don't know exactly what my role is here is, uh, but I'm going to uh, introduce a speaker that we've all been looking forward to see. Uh, if you want to see me do any comedy, 17th of April in Walthamstow. <laughs> At Miss D Comedy, we can talk about this. Uh, but I am I'm super honoured, uh, leaning back on my days as a um, as a proper person. Uh, by the way, my accent is because I'm from uh, Wolfenstow. Um, <laughs> via Israel, I'm sorry. It's uh, I know I always apologise for that, both for the accent and for the country. Uh, this is gone now again. Thank you. Okay, you can already see that our uh, speaker is a uh, man of the time. He's always there to help. Uh, I hope he's going to help our economy. Uh, I am honoured uh, to introduce to you the 36th uh, MP uh, to nominate Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, last year, right? That was it. That, that's what it says here. Uh, it does. Uh, and the shadow uh, chancellor of the Exchequer. You've all raised really interesting uh, and painful problems uh, here in Barnet. I'm glad that I'm from Walthamstow, where the only problem is Stella Creasy. Uh, <laughs> but please, uh, in this slightly symbolic uh, state of affairs, uh, would you kindly put your hand together uh, and welcome to uh, the stage. Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, Anthony John McDonald. I apologise. <coughs> I've got a bit of a cold. I apologise for being so late, but there's been a succession of meetings this evening I've had to attend. Um, I'm not allowed to do stand up anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, and I'm not allowed to use props, red books, or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, given, I've given that up. Um, let me just say, let me tell you where I think we've got to, okay, over the last 10 months. Some, uh, 10 months ago, um, when we lost, the, when Labour lost the election, uh, on that Friday morning, pre pre people were pretty despondent at the situation. I, I worked on the basis that we might have got small majority or maybe was probably the largest party. None of us, I think, expected the Tories to get back with a majority. Um, they got back with a, a majority of 12 but on the basis of securing the vote of less than 25% of the electorate, so hardly an overwhelming mandate at that point in time. And at that stage, to be frank, I was looking forward to drifting into um, quiet retirement, um, hopefully being seen as a sort of a failed elder statesman of the left, grumbling at the back of these meetings so we wouldn't be in this mess if they'd listen to me. <laughs> but then Jeremy, as you know, there was a lot of pressure to run a left candidate in the um, leadership election from the left organisations and individuals right the way across the Labour Party and beyond. And we organised a number of meetings called the Left Platform where we argued with people, um, we had three meetings, we argued with people, Jeremy and I argued with people, that there was no way that we could get a left candidate on the ballot paper, um, and there was no hope of actually securing much of a vote, maybe at best 15 or 20 percent, something like that. So the first moral of this story is do not accept any betting tips from me, because <laughs> um, large numbers of people did put uh, money on Jeremy, well at that stage it was 200 to 1, and I'm about the only person who didn't. Uh, <laughs> Jeremy got on the ballot paper because we, I, I chaired his campaign committee, we did a, uh, an exercise of lobbying and getting people to support him, and we won on the basis in the last 10 seconds before closing nominations, because we did a deal with five of them, that we got to 34, they would nominate to 35. Um, the last 10 seconds we were at 33 and two of them cracked and we got on the ballot paper. As you most probably know the story, at that point in time we had to go and find Jeremy to tell him he was the candidate. <laughs> we'd, uh, we'd, we'd gone round the table to try and find out who was the candidate and I'd said I'd done it a couple of times, didn't want to do it. 
and um, Diane had done it once and had had enough. And um, so that's why we looked at Jeremy and said, come on, it's your turn. And he said, at that stage, I'll go on then. Okay, and that was it. We got on the ballot paper, and I tell you what happened was, is that um, I think what came as a real shock to all of us was the scale of engagement during that electoral process. Um, I did the traditional left thing, you must probably know. I, as the organizer, I did the traditional left thing and say to our volunteers, book halls no bigger than 100. <laughs> Do not have fixed seats because you're not to be able to pull the chairs away if no one turns up. You want to move about and make sure it looks crowded. Um, we did our first meeting. Um, Jeremy did the first meeting. He asked me would I do a tour with him around the country. And you know the joke, but I tell him we went around the country together. It would look like last of summer wine on tour. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, we booked the first meeting for 100. 500 people turned up. It was unbelievable. Some of you most probably went to these meetings. We booked the next ones for 500. We had 1,000 turned up. It was just phenomenal, the numbers that turned out. And if some of you might have been at the Camden Bidra Centre when that happened, a couple of thousand inside, we got the FBU fire engine outside to Jeremy to speak from to address the street. It was just not amazing. And there's a great film, I keep quoting it, of a couple of young people breaking into the hall, not breaking out. <laughs> and it was just remarkable. And at those meetings, what was incredible, Jeremy did 100 of those, so we think he spoke to maybe between 80 and 100,000 people. It's just phenomenal in that limited period of time. At those meetings, people who turned up, lots of young people, uh, young workers, students and others, all ages of people come turning up, but also lots of people who dropped out of political activity and wanted to get back involved again. And what was coming out of those meetings, they weren't just rallies or anything like that, a lot of them were discussions, people were turning up with their problems, identifying the issues, and what came out of that was basically the manifesto upon which Jeremy stood. So when people turned up, when students turned up and said, we're exploring, but it just is very much like the Sanders campaign at the moment. They were saying, these are the sort of levels of debt I'm coming out of university from, 30, 40, 50,000 pounds. And the solution was straightforward. You know, I, I believe in, in, in the, the, the ability of crowds, the imagination of crowds, people working, people coming together. The solution is obvious. So the solution is you scrap tuition fees. You scrap them, you get rid of them. And it's based upon a principle that education is not a commodity to be bought and sold. It's a gift from one generation to another. And we secured that principle, you know, we secured that principle a century ago in the development of the policies of the Labour and Trade Union movement <laughs> leading to the construction of the welfare state for Atlee. The other issue that came up, particularly in London and the South East, people were turning up with, uh, and identifying housing at crisis point everywhere. Now, you tell me what it's like in your area, but tonight in my constituency, consistently every night, there'll be 200 families in bed and breakfast. There will be people sleeping in sheds and garages that are rented to them. So we have now beds in sheds on a mass scale. I have a shanty town developed in Hayes at the moment, in different parts of it. We have people sleeping along the canal and under the bridges, and never counted as homeless by the Hillary Council because they never do the count effectively. And we've reinvented I'm, I'm from Liverpool originally, I'm from the North region. I lost my accent, we moved up and down when I was a kid. But we've reinvented what was a northern phenomenon, which was back-to-back -back houses. So in my constituency now, the landlords are renting out the front of the house and the back of the house to different families. And again, the average rent in my constituency now is between 12 and 1,600 pounds a month. Yeah. People, to, people to pay for that work all hours, God send. My constituency is West London, working class, multicultural community. We've got he throw airport within it. People afford that by working all hours, God said. And I went, I went to a school play which teenagers had drafted up, and I thought it was really, it was about drugs. And one was acting as the child, another was acting as the parents. I thought it was really well written, because they were, the parents were telling the, the, the child off for getting into drugs. And what was interesting, and they, they'd written it themselves, and they took, the child turned around and said to the parents in this play, um, don't tell me what to do, I never see you together. And that's because people are working different shifts, so parents cross. So you never see the family all together at any one time. And I thought that was interesting that someone, one of those teenagers had sat down and written that as an expression of the way their family now has to operate because the housing costs 
so heavy, your working all hours got to send just to pay the mortgage or pay the rent or whatever. Can I also say that the solution then that came up from all the discussions, you know, it's not rocket science. The solution is that for nearly 30 years we haven't built council houses, we've sold them off and we haven't replaced them. And that started with Thatcher and that went on the pace over the last 30 years since the 80s. So the solution is very simple. You start building council houses again on a mass scale. <laughs> I, I, I became political as a teenager in the 60s, um, and, I, and I, was, uh, I, can, you know, I can remember Martin Luther King's speech, I can remember Kennedy, and I can remember Harold Wilson, much to famed as a Labour Prime Minister. But I can remember him being denounced for undermining a target to build half a million homes. Mm. And that sounds like dreamland now, but that actually is what people were producing, two, three hundred thousand properties a year, and they were, they were council houses at fair rents. And that's the other thing that came out of the discussion on housing. You see, it's all well and good. We go back into government next time in 2020, and we'll start building immediately, straight away. We'll release local authorities. We'll borrow the money to give them the resources. We'll use pension funds as well, because they're resources that we'd want to see invested effectively. And give you a, would give a, from the rents, then you'd have a stable income as well to, for, the, for that pension, pension fund itself. But in the meantime, we will still have people living in private rented accommodation whilst until we build the properties that we need. Now, again, what came out of all our discussions, particularly in London and the South East, <coughs> is that the rates now are, are just unmanageable. They're so high, as I explained in my own. So <coughs> we've even persuaded Sadiq Khan, uh, our, our London mayoral candidate, now to start exploring the whole concept now of rent controls. Mm. Now, in this... <laughs> In, the, if I survive, in this country, we used to have, and it sounds like fantasy now, we used to have a system called fair rents. And there was a fair rent officer who would come round and assess whether that rent was fair. It was assessed against local wages and rents, etc., economic conditions. That happens in capital cities across Europe. It's only us that have withdrawn from that over that period. Can I say also, we were, Jeremy and I were involved in the shelter campaign too where we were arguing that properties standing empty should not be allowed. It's immoral and a crime that they stand empty while there's a homeless family. Yeah. 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 We were arguing, we were arguing, we've been arguing that for the last decade or so at least, but it's interesting. We've got 700,000 empty properties in this country at the moment. 300,000 of them standing empty more than six months. Now there's a piece in the paper today which I thought was really helpful there's further research that's been done on that, particularly in relation to London. And it demonstrates the powers that councils have to put pressure on landlords to bring them back into use. And there are extensive powers at the moment that some local authorities, like Islington, are beginning to use. And also in, in the South East, some local authorities are beginning to use those powers more effectively. But we want to strengthen them so that no property stands empty whilst a, a family is, is homeless. So those sort of issues came up time and time again. We had health workers come along to those meetings, explaining to us the pressure that they were under as a result of the work, and explaining also what they saw going on around them, which was a combination of the assets being destroyed as a result of inherited PFIs, and at the same time, the privatisation that was being undertaken by stealth in the award of contracts, particularly by CCGs. <coughs> so the solution, quite straightforwardly now, is to reassert the NHS as a public service, free at the point of need, you end all privatisation and you finish off the PFIs. Now if that means... <laughs> we want to end the use of PFI all times in the future, but if that means we have to look at the financial arrangements for buying back some of those PFIs, quite honestly, some of them we've looked at, it would be cheaper to buy them out and get rid of them and not put them off the backs of, off the backs of some local NHS authorities. All of those issues were coming through, and I thought it was a really creative period. I'll give you one th other, other example, really. Uh, people came up about the energy prices and what was happening with regard to um, you being screwed by the big energy companies. Almost, like, It's not a monopoly, but it's oligopoly, but a not small number. The big four or five control the energy supplies in this country, not very effectively in terms of supply, because we've got real dangers now about the inconsistency of supply over a period of time because of lack of investment, but also that they can virtually charge what they want. Now, 
again, we weren't looking at a radical revolutionary model. We were just looking at the work that Alan Simpson, MP, he's no longer an MP, right. but one of our advisors, had done around the journal system, whereby they'd freed up local authorities and local community groups to develop their own local renewable energy supplies that then tapped into the national grid. Now, what they've done is they've broken the oligopoly of the four <coughs> firms. So nearly, I think it's nearly about 60% now is done by local, local authorities, local community groups, often co-ops, where they have a stake in feeding into the grid, and that then gives them the opportunity of reducing their own prices. And again, it was just creativity like that that was being brought born out of Jeremy's campaign um, that, that got him elected. Finally, let me say this on the issue. We had a, a, a lot of discussions around the issue of peace. And the whole point about the whole point about the new Labour regime, I just say this to be honest. I you know, I I voted against um, New Labour on a whole range of topics and all the rest of it. And and to be frank, you can get arrogant in this game. You, uh, to be frank, I think we were right on virtually every occasion we voted against them. I don't say that with any sense of joy, because you, when you're in a political party, you want to be part of it, you want to be supportive of it. So, But when they're going wrong, you have to say it was wrong. Now, with, with Tony Blair, I, have, you know, I don't have a very close, warm relationship with Tony Blair. <laughs> can I just say this? I, when he brought up, when he con consolidated the work that was done by John Major um, with regard to bringing about the Northern Ireland peace process, as, a, as an Irish Republican, I was I couldn't thank him enough, to be honest. <laughs> and if he did, at that point in time, if, if at that point in time he'd stopped there, I think he would have gone down in history <laughs> yeah, as a peacemaker. Yeah. Then Iraq came. Mm. Then Iraq came, and I think that destroyed what good. The uh, reputation he'd built up as a as other piece. And, and again, there was that contradiction. There was that contradiction that I actually couldn't understand until then you discussed with him his relationship with Bush, etc. And that bizarre relationship that, that, that took place. So what came out of the discussions that we had is that we want to return the Labour Party to being a party of peace rather than a party of military adventure and aggression. And that means no <laughs> That's why, that's why the majority of the Parliamentary Labour Party, the majority of the Shadow Cabinet, but, and I think the vast majority of Labour Party members and supporters were opposed to the bombing of Syria. We're now moving on now into the debate about what happens with Trident. Um, it's very clear what Jeremy's and my own position is. We've campaigned as members of CND. Scrapping nuclear weapons altogether and scrapping Trident. Now, the way in which we're trying to deal with that is we're a member of a political party in which we involve in democratic debate and discussion. We're doing the review of Trident and we're trying to open up. We're trying to open up the debate so people come at this rationally because actually some of the debate around Trident, etc., has been irrational to a sense. It's almost an emotional issue. And what we're trying to say is let's look at the practicalities of this. But in particular, I just have to say whatever. Then the, figure, the figures are argued whether it's 30 billion or 100 million. 100 billion. I'll tell you one thing, I'd rather spend it on the NHS and education than I would on bombing people. Those, those are the policies that, that um, we discussed and determined during that campaign, and we advocated. And as a result of that, as you know, Jeremy won 59.5% of the vote, both in terms of members, supporters, and affiliated supporters. Now, all through the campaign, we had volunteers, and some of you were there, doing telephone canvassing, and they were reporting back consistently 60% support, and I didn't believe them. We retrained them and retrained them time and time again, <laughs> and we double-checked them. The eve of poll, the eve before the nom the eve before close of nomination, or close of poll, they came back with exactly the same 60%. So when we went into the QE2 for the announcement of the result, when 59, we were told privately then what the result was, 59.5, I was... I was amazed. I have to. I, I went back and apologised to the volunteers in the end because they got it right. <laughs> this is, again, it's the wisdom of crowds. Really. Come on. What was significant for me, Jeremy did his speech. He went and thanked all the volunteers. But what was most significant for me, the first act of the new Labour leader was to go and join the demonstration. <laughs> Vulnerable and in many ways but derided group of people within our community. It was an act of solidarity. Since then, let me just tell you, 
Um, Jerry put together Shadow Cabinet, a broad, a broad Shadow Cabinet, left, right, and centre, uh, in the tradition of the Labour Party to hold the party together. The Parliamentary Labour Party, whatever you read within in the media and all the rest of it, man. And I said, there's young people here, I just don't want to disillusion you, but you can't always believe everything you read in the day to day. But when a, the Parliamentary Labour Party, the vast bulk of them, just want to get on with the job of opposing the Tories. Yeah. The vast bulk of them want to engage in the debate around policy. They might not all agree on different aspects that Jeremy's raised, but they want to discuss that and determine that out democratically. Within the Shadow Cabinet, we had a bit of a long, lengthy reshuffle because Jeremy's to be frank, I find him the most caring, compassionate person I've come across in politics. And he just wanted to engage with people. So, and that's why it took so long. He talked and talked and talked to see whether or not he could bring people around. It didn't work. So we got the reshuffle done. Again, the majority within the Shadow Cabinet just want to get on with the job, opposing the Tories, and engaging now in the development of policy that will take us to the next election. Now, that engagement with policy will be a democratic debate. One of the key things we're doing now is restoring democracy to the Labour Party intensely. Now, when I joined the Labour Party, you were given a little booklet, and it said this, it said, you are now a member of the Labour Party. And to be honest, when I joined, it was a proud occasion. I was proud to join a political party that I had faith in and all the rest of it, and I was going to get out there in the streets, etc. And that said, you can turn up your local branch meeting, you can move a resolution. If it's carried, it can go to the management committee. If it's carried... That could even go to the Labour Party conference. If it's carried there, it will become party policy for a Labour government to implement. Now, I know it never always works, but actually you still had that prospect. That democracy, that line of democracy within the party got closed down to a large extent under New Labour. We're reopening that again now. At the last Labour Party conference, we'd only been in position for a week, literally a week. And yet there was a, a democratic discussion and debate, and we changed from a party that had been austerity light to an anti-austerity party. <coughs> we, phys we physically voted for that, and every member of the Parliamentary Labour Party who spoke at that conference prefaced their remarks on the sort of support for an anti-austerity position. And I think that was a major breakthrough. And partly it was because an additional 2,500 members turned up at that conference. It was just, atmosphere was absolutely transformed. And that's what we're trying to do at every level of the party now. And that's going to be a, a struggle to engage people, get them involved, and use a new method to uh, new media and social media in particular, but to thoroughly get them into the democratic process and open that up. There are some who, who are, are still unhappy at Jeremy's election, can't accept his mandate, but they're a small, tiny minority. And some of them, to be frank, I'm trying to understand all this, I suppose it's pseudo-psychology, but it's about some of them feel dispossessed. They, you know, they saw, they had a trajectory of what they saw as their lives ahead of them. You know, some of them on the back of an envelope, you know, MP at such an age, minister at such an age, leader at such an age, Prime Minister at such an age. And some of them now don't, have, lost that, have lost that route in their life. And to be frank, I'm trying to understand that and get them back on board. And I just say, look, I've, I've been 18 years on the back benches. I've won one vote in 18 years and now so you know, I'm getting used to it. You know? <laughs> and Jer Jeremy's done 30 odd years. Uh, so I, I, used to, I, I did this thing at his 30th anniversary and they said, you know, Jeremy is my closest friend in Parliament, and as my wife said, he's your only bloody friend. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, what we're trying to do is bring people in, and we're trying to make sure that the broad church of the Labour Party is properly respected, that people can play their roles, and, that, and at the same time, we become effective in, in terms of both mobilising opposition in Parliament, but more importantly, building the movement outside of Parliament against the Tories and for, for a better future. And I'll just finish on, on, on this point. The, at the end of the campaign in September, a lot of the people who were involved in that campaign said, look, where do we go now? We've got to keep on going. And I said, that's true. What we're building now is we're reconstructing a political party, of course, but more importantly, we're trying to rebuild the labour and trade union movement onto what it was when it was first established, which wasn't just about electoral politics. It was building a social movement. So what we're saying now very clearly is that what we want to build now is a democratic, open democratic party based upon a social movement. And the people at the end of the campaign in September, we want to keep on going on, we want to maintain the momentum. And someone said, well, why don't we call the movement that? And I said, great, let's get on with it. But the whole purpose is to demonstrate 
you may, you know, we've got to win elections. There's no doubt about that. We've got to campaign and win elections. We've got to be an electoral force, and that's tough at the moment with all the media coming at us <laughs> and all the establishment mobilising against us. But we've got to build as an electoral force over these coming years. But to do that, you've also got to build as a social movement that creates a climate of opinion and support for those policies. But in addition to that, there's no use just building an electoral force if you're on the left because you can easily be swept away. You've got to build both an electoral force through a political party, but also a social movement rooted and based within communities and within the trade union movement, within civil society overall. And that's what we're trying to do at the moment. I think I, it's a huge ambition, a massive ambition, but I think it's really exciting, absolutely exciting. We've, I've waited for this most, I've never, I've waited for a socialist leader of the Labour Party all of my life. <laughs> now it's come along, now this opportunity has come along, I think all of us have a responsibility to grab it with both hands and make sure we're This was both uh, moving and inspiring. I think we've heard some alternatives to austerity. Uh, John, can you answer a few questions? Uh, I just want to say, this is the bit where I do understand why I was asked to do this. I am trying to kill. Uh, please, short questions, no speeches, because we will need to get out of here uh, within about 20, 20 minutes or so, I believe. So uh, please raise your hands uh, and uh, make your questions brief. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh Oh, yeah. Good evening. <laughs> um, so, Trevor. Trevor. Um, <laughs> sorry. My apologies. Uh, Yasmin Parsons from our West Hendon. Um, hey. I, uh, I'm going to ask a, a personal question now on the political program that the BBC One put out on a Sunday, party politics, political politics? Sunday politics. Sunday politics. Our MP, Mr Matthew Orville, told, told, the, told the public at large that our estate was, no, was a no-go area at night and he was basing this on police figures, which don't exist. <laughs> Well, at the moment, I'm trying to get a right to reply, so I want him on the box, and I'll be having a word with him, so as the public can actually see what it's really like to be on a council estate. At the moment, I'm getting no reply from the BBC. I think they just lost their back spine. I was wondering if you would be able to help in any way in ensuring that we do get on there, and we do get this quite soon, because the documentary uh, documenting the lives of the, the residents of West Hendon during a period of regeneration over a year should be coming out by March the 20th on BBC One after the news. I'm hoping that everybody not only will watch it, but ensure that it's spread throughout because we need people to see this and it will have a massive effect on the mayor elections and hopefully we'll wake up the entire nation as to what's really going on. I won't go into anything else because I want you just to say, yes, you're going to help us. <laughs> yes, I'll help you. Yay! The, the issue around the BBC, so I'm a supporter of the BBC because I believe in public broadcasting and we've had a meeting. I used to be the um, Secretary of the NUJ group in Parliament until I got the show of Chancellorship. But there's a meeting in the Commons tonight which is about protecting public broadcasting. So. With regard to the BBC, we're doing everything we possibly can to protect the concept of public broadcasting. But can I say, in terms of some of the stuff that they've done recently, and partly it's about the way in which there's been cutbacks on quality journalism. The number of journalists and such are working for the BBC. There's been massive cutbacks. And what we're finding time and time again is that whereas they're not doing their own detailed research, they're lifting the stories directly from the press. Mm -hmm. And the press itself, as you know, is owned by a small number of oligarchs that are hardly mm -hmm. sympathetic to what we're doing. So there is an element, apart from the Morning Star, yes. Thank you, yeah. yes. Yeah, um, <laughs> and apart, so there is an element within the, within the BBC where there's a struggle going on all the time. 
between ju quality journalists who just want to do good reporting and then a management, to be honest with you, time is quite intimidating as well, will just deliver the same message time and time again that the, the Tory press are delivering. With regard to your own situation, I've had it in my constituency as well, in, in that I, they've got a very argued part of my patch where I live and no-go areas and all the rest of it. And what we've done is we've campaigned in the streets, leaflets, etc. And time and time again, people, we've sent people up to the BBC as well, if necessary, leaflet in the Piccadilly and outside there too. Anything I can do, drop us an email, and anything I can do to put pressure on them for you, I certainly will, because it's important that you know, they fulfil their charter, which is balanced reporting at all times. And that should include the right to reply. By the way, with Leveson, Leveson hasn't been implemented at all. Uh, you know, they came out of all the scandals about the phone hacking and stuff like that. They've now set up this new new body, not under uh, to, uh, to assess the press or monitor the press, not under Leveson proposals, but the new body is dominated by the editors again of those very papers that we're, uh, we, we're trying to hold to account. And again, when it comes to the BBC and elsewhere, what we're arguing for now is greater accountability and democratic accountability to the general public about how they operate and also greater accountability to their own staff and trade unions that should be represented on their boards and trusts. Um, you've talked uh, about people's quantitative easing, which of course won't work that way. We are in fact talking Keynesian economics, aren't we? I hope we are. Um, let's explain to people what we're talking about so everyone knows. During Jeremy's campaign, um, Richard Murphy did some of the work around our economic policies, and they came out with this proposal about quantum of easing. You know what that is? It's basically the, the government in the economic crisis that we had, when the banks collapsed, and there was a credit crunch, a liquidity crisis. What happens is the government effectively starts printing money, basically, and then get the idea is to get money flowing within the system again. The way it worked last time around, 2008, 2009, what's happened is actually it's, it's increased um, asset prices. And so people, the, the very people who caused the crisis, the bankers and others, have actually benefited from the quantitative easing. And they're the ones who've actually made a fortune as a result of this because of the asset prices going up. So the way in which, if we've got to that situation again, um, where you needed to inject resources into the economy <coughs> to get it going and, and stimulate demand. The argument was put forward, why don't we do quant people's quantitative easing, whereby, and the idea was you'd set up a national investment bank, you'd put money into that, and they would invest then in the infrastructure that would then create the jobs, etc. So people would be directly benefited. So rather than just giving them, printing money and giving it to the banks, mm -hmm. you would actually direct it more fruitfully in, in, a, in a more effective way to stimulate the economy. My view, to be honest, is quantitative easing is the last resort in a, and it's usable in, in parts of the economic <coughs> cycle, if necessary. At the moment, to be frank, borrowing costs are so low, if we wanted to develop the housing, the infrastructure, the broadband, the new technology that we wanted, we'd, we'd want to set up a national investment bank. But we'd most probably use just straightforward borrowing, because borrowing costs are so low at the moment. Next week, there'll be a, a report by Osborne, and he's appointed Andrew Adonis, setting up an infrastructure commission, which actually was a Labour idea in the first place. Andrew O'Donis was a Labour minister. They're going to produce a report about the infrastructure projects that need to go ahead. The big fear is the report will be all publicity and razzmatazz, but with no backing behind it, because Osborne is, uh, is basically arguing that we, sh we shouldn't borrow anymore because we've got such a large amount of debt. Now, the reason we've got such a large amount of debt is actually because his austerity measures have failed. Mm -hmm. But if you borrowed at the right time in the economic cycle, you, in, you supplied long-term patient investment, you'd grow the economy, you'd get people back to work, you'd increase aggregate demand, and there'd be a prosperity there. But the most important thing is when we build that prosperity, it's properly shared by everybody rather than just the rich 1% that have actually gained from the economic crisis whilst the rest of us have paid for their failures. I think um, I'm not the only one convinced by, by John here, and we want Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister, and we want John McCoy as the Chancellor of the, the Chequers, and therefore we need to increase the vote 
And uh, I don't know if people here know that there was a change in legislation and many people were effectively struck off the register. So if you know anyone who is not registered for voting, there are postcards here. There is a campaign by Hope Not Hate to encourage, and the unions to encourage registering to vote. And I think the deadline for it is mid April, so we need to really get our act together and encourage people to register to vote as individuals, not as household, because that's the part that will change. Yeah. Um, my name is Frank Kovacs, my first um, momentum meeting, and it's very exciting. Can you reconcile something for me, which is between a, a Labour's decision at the moment to go into Europe, to stay within Europe, um, and you mentioned energy and the way that the Germans uh, are, are being inventive about it and, and cracking up the oligarchy by using energy locally um, and feeding into the system. But then we have TTIP. Um, so I'm, I'm finding it difficult to reconcile those two things uh, in my mind. I don't think enough people know about it. So, yeah. Uh, no, the people people increasingly become aware of TTIP. This is the transatlantic trade agreement that's being negotiated at the moment by, by the EU and the Americans, but largely negotiated in secret. And that's the huge, um, I think, critical issue that we need to face as part of the EU campaign. In the run-up to the referendum, we've, uh, Jeremy has raised in each of the statements now that Cameron has made on the full House of Commons, He's raised the issue of TTIP. Our position in the Labour Party at the moment that we've arrived at is basically we wish to remain within the EU as part of a solidarity movement, working with socialist and social democratic parties and other movements across Europe, but we're not satisfied with the existing institutional arrangements of the EU or its policies, which are largely neoliberal. Mm -hmm. So again, it's linking up with those other socialists and social democrats who see the need for international cooperation and international solidarity at the European level but don't see the need, don't see the, don't, do not support the policies or the institutional arrangements for the EU as they now stand. So what we're trying to do is bring forward in this EU camp, referendum campaign is saying, yes, we want to remain within, but we need to develop our own progressive reform agenda. Now, there's been a whole series of initiatives that are bubbling up across Europe, and Jeremy's going to invite various representative groups to London, and we, we're going to flash them out and talk them through over the next couple of months. But for example, Yanis Varoufakis, who's was the Greek finance minister, he's one of our advisors. He's, he's set up this thing called DM that's looking at a 10 year program of reform of the European Union to ensure, for example, in the first years, openness and transparency of all decision making processes. And then moving on then to institutional <coughs> arrangements, which would again devolve powers back to national parliaments, but more effectively also involve wider civil society in determining policies at the European level. Now, again, I think I support all that, and that's why I'm happy to campaign to remain within the EU, but I'm not willing to appear on Tory platforms or anything like that, because they have a completely different agenda from us. Ours is trying to develop a social Europe based upon class politics, to be frank. Now, in terms of TTIP, the issue there for us is a, is a secret negotiation <laughs> going on of a trade agreement that could actually undermine the ability of a, an elected government in this country under Jeremy Corbyn, for example, to renationalize rail. For example, if we don't get the NHS excluded, it could prevent us ending the privatization of the NHS. So that becomes part of the campaign now for the reform program that we want to see within Europe. It's interesting in the, in the um, meetings that we've had with socialist and social democratic parties across Europe, most of them are on the same page as us. So I can see that actually if we can get more into power, because the right have assumed power in quite a number of countries across Europe, if we can get the left and progressive forces back into power, you can see the effect of re progressive reform of the European Union on the basis, as I say, of a, a social Europe based upon a combination of redistribution of wealth, redistribution of power, but also this issue around energy in particular, about the, the tackling climate change at a European level in a cooperative way. I'll just say one final thing as well. I'll just give a Another example, we've been working for the last 10 years as part of the tax justice campaign around tax evasion and tax avoidance, and all of a sudden, you know, thank, well, thanks to UK Uncut a number of years ago, direct action raised the issue off the agenda. And I just showed you how effective direct action can be at times. Now, all of a sudden, with Google and all the rest, we've been able to expose what, what they've been doing. We've been <coughs> allying ourselves with the socialists and social democrats across Europe 
to ensure that we have a European system now where we cooperate to tackle tax evasion, tax avoidance, so these companies can't, can't just shift their headquarters around different tax havens in, in that way. And again, it just demonstrates the ability of us to cooperate at that level and be effective. What we discovered in the last couple of months, though, where we were having some success in, in uh, agreeing with others about the mechanisms that need to be brought forward, Osborne, on six different occasions, briefed Tory MEPs to vote against every international agreement that was coming up from the EU. So you can see where we've got to at the moment. And that's the other issue around the economy and Keynesianism. To be honest, I, a lot of this time, in terms of where is where we, they keep on saying, we, you've got all these plans, how are you going to afford them? But we're going to afford them on the basis of corporations and rich people just paying their bloody taxes. For <laughs> Uh, here on the left. Uh, uh, yeah, that's exactly not what I said, but that's fine. Go ahead, and then the gentleman. No, I just want to do some admin, please. Warning. Uh, one question from here, one question here, and two questions here, and I think that would be probably. Um, hi, um, I'm Jessica. I'm sitting in political politics at the moment, and one of the key issues discussing right now is obviously Brexit, the UK is possible leaving of the EU, and the media and the government have been focusing on the immigration side, but they haven't really discussed the economics effect it would have on the UK, and I just want to know what specifically that would be, us leaving um, the EU. The big issue for many people that they're arguing for is, <coughs> is that what we secured through the EU, I suppose, was opening up the, the European markets and the ability to trade more effectively, etc. What's interesting, in the north, I've been up in the northeast quite a bit, and um, the Northeast, we've had a transformation in the Northeast in terms of political representation. We, we used to be represented by Peter Mandelson, Milburn, and Tony Blair, <laughs> um, which is not exactly the most radical, um, the radical coalition of forces within the Labour Party. Since they're, they're, they're leaving, it's been replaced by a large number of trade union activists who have become MPs as a result of um, a history of campaigning and struggle in the party. And, I, and I've been talking to them, and they're They've been campaigning very, very strongly with regard to a post of Brexit on the basis of the number of jobs within their constituencies that have been developed that are dependent on the, the, the trade with the, the EU market itself. And also the, the, the way in which they've been able to access European funds, particularly um, the European Regional Development Fund, etc., for infrastructure projects and others. Years ago, before I was an MP, I was a, a bit of a politician and a bureaucrat. And I used to be the chief executive of the Association of London Government, and we administered the European funds for London overall. And you could see how actually by cooperating on a transnational basis, you could learn lessons about how you tackle particularly economic and social issues together. And in that way, you harness the EU resources more effectively, and it builds those sort of links of solidarity as well. So I think the real issue for us is the impact that will be on jobs itself. The reason Jeremy has been critical of what's been happening in the last few days about these negotiations that Cameron were, was having. The, the negotiations were nothing to do with national interest. It was all about party management and the Conservative Party. Um, and to be frank, coming away from Europe, claiming their success by impoverishing some of the poor children in Europe is not exactly a, something I, I want, anyone would want to be proud of, I don't think. But the issue that Jeremy kept on raising with Cameron is that they did nothing with regard to tax evasion, tax avoidance, they did nothing about real long-term investment in infrastructure across Europe where we could cooperate in that way. And they did nothing about joint prosperity, uh, and particularly assisting countries like Greece that have been exploited and bullied so much by, by the Troika. So all those issues were, were, were ignored. Where we are at the moment, I think, as I say, is building up this progressive alliance across Europe that will develop opposition to austerity and neoliberal policies and look for progressive policies about investment in s skills, in infrastructure and new technology, and raising everyone, not trickle down, but forcing up from the grassroots itself. And I think, I think there's real, real potential there. The problem is, you, you, tell, you tell me what you think, the problem is we're going to have UKIP and some elements of the Tory party that will focus the whole issue in the campaign up to the referendum on immigration, migration, etc. Yeah. And I'm fearful, to be honest, that will be exploited by the far right as well. And I think we've We've got to be very clear about that, that we protect our, we protect the whole issue of open borders, but also in addition to that, we make sure we have our own policies that we're bringing forward, which is about not allowing agencies or employers 
to use cheap labor to undermine wage, wage settlements or wage agreements or levels of wages or employment conditions wherever they are, whether in Britain or any else, anywhere else in Europe. So it's a positive campaign we've got to win. <laughs> So I'll just use my voice. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I've long had an interest in economics, and I just I don't know what the legal uh, problems might be, but I don't see why in future a Labour government couldn't do two things. One is bringing legislation that says all companies, especially over a certain size and international, have to have a licence in order to operate in this country and that you couldn't set up a forensic tax commission <coughs> stuck with highly paid forensic accountants to say that every year, this has been your turnover in this country, this has been your trade, this is what you owe us in tax, if you don't like it, we take your license, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure you put that in parliamentary language. <laughs> at the moment, um, at the moment, what, some people are aware of what we've done from the Treasury team, We've set up, an, uh, the issue around Labour and getting elected is economic credibility. We lost the last election because of a lack of economic credibility, to be frank. And the, the argument that was put forward was that we were austerity light, never, no one really understood what our message was, but also people just didn't trust us with the economy. The way we overcome that is we put in institutional arrangements. One is an economic advisory council that meets on a regular basis now to advise us about macroeconomic policy. And that includes um, Joseph Stiglitz, Mariana Mazzucato, uh, Kiketti, a whole range of uh, unchallengeable economists globally, those with global reputations, basically. They meet on a regular <coughs> basis now uh, and looking at microeconomic policy for us and testing the ideas and the instruments that, that we want to use when we go back to the government. Below them, or alongside them, we now institute a range of reviews, again, from unchallengeable people. The Treasury has been reviewed by Bob Kerslake, who used to work for years ago, he was head of civil service. We've got a review of HMRC, the tax collectors, which includes how the HMRC operates, the tax base upon which we're, we're developing our future tax regimes, uh, and the whole, the whole legal basis of companies, etc. That's been run by a guy called Professor Prem Seeker, with about 30 others in, in the team. Some of them from the tax justice campaign, all of them are, are trained accountants and experts, etc. All of them academically and practically un unchallengeable, including Richard Murphy, etc. So all that is going on at pace. Ideas that you're throwing in like that are being considered. Um, again, what we're trying to do as well is link up with others, working in other countries on this issue, because the issue around taxation is, <coughs> has got to be dealt with, just, not just at EU level, but globally as well. And what we're finding is the depth of work that there is there, it just needs the political will then to implement it. What we're finding at the moment in this country is the whole concept of corporate capture. You have a government that is literally captured by the corporations. So the big accountancy firms, the big four basically, write our taxation policy for us. And if you look at every government department now, uh, again, infiltrated by those companies that, are, that will eventually seek to make a profit at the development of policy, within those departments. I think we've got to expose that. And it's interesting that Bernie Sanders' campaign in America, they're much more aggressive about this in terms of their language. And they look at the system being rigged. They look at corporate corruption and all the rest of it. And to be frank, I think we're tainted in the same way. <laughs> Yourself and yourself, and then one question at the very, very back, uh, and we will see how we're doing. We might have to end with that. Right, okay, uh, cool. I'm Anthony, um, I'm a student nurse from the Bursary of Us campaign. Just, just to quickly answer your question about the EU, if we uh, had a Brexit, um, the number of staff that we, nursing staff that we get from the EU at the moment, it'd crash our NHS. So when they get into an immigration conversation, UKIP, you need to hit back at them with the fact that it's a vote against your NHS. A quick question I just wanted to ask you, Mr. McDonald, is on the first uh, junior doctor protest in January, we saw you come out for that. On the second one, I think Hadi Alexander had a word with you about coming. Now that the BMA have said that they're going to go out on strike, and now that Unison and other unions, the student nurses, we say that we're going to go out with them in support, 
Are we likely to see you in solidarity with them again? Yay! It's a, it's a valid point on, on Brexit and the NHS, and Jeremy raised it in his uh, response to Cam, Cameron today. I was on the picket line for the junior doctors. At the weekend, we had the LRC conference, and Yanis um, for the BMA was speaking, and I made it very, very clear that I've been given 100% solidarity, etc., and be on picket lines for the future. I'm part of the Save Barnet Libraries campaign. Uh, we're facing brutal cuts to our library service. And the solution the Tories are proposing is, is to go to the volunteer model. And I want to ask you, will Labour oppose the erosion of our library service and the wholesale adoption of the volunteer library model? And will you su support the strengthening of legislation to protect our library service? Yeah. I, will, I will personally. I'm not sure where the development of policy has been on this because we're, we're obviously in that stage where we're moving on from our last manifesto to, to the new commitments that we'll have. Just on a personal basis, I'll be doing that. I was campaigning on the library closures issue right the way across London before the last election. I think we got a lot of purchase, actually, because a lot of people were exactly. angry about what was, yes. what was going on. Um, we've seen a number of Labour councils as well close mm -hmm. libraries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so what we've been saying to, to Labour councils, mm -hmm. very particularly, is that we understand the legal position you're in about setting a balanced budget and all the rest. We understand that. It's not like in the 80s when I was chair of finance of the GLC, you know, we had the rate capping campaign, we defined the request we could, and you could continue on for a period of use enough whatever resource you had. It's more difficult now because the officers can come in and set your budgets. But what we've said to Labour councils, use every mechanism you possibly can to avoid the cuts. But then if, if you're faced with a situation where the officers are going to move in on you, we understand that. But the most important thing is to expose what's going on mm. and to mobilise with your local trade unions, local community organisations, and, and, and to campaign to blame the, the real people who are this, and that's this Tory central government. On libraries, I just think, I, their <laughs> reflection, I think libraries are like other, other, some are a few limited other things. They're a demonstration of whether or not you've got a civilised society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then access to... <laughs> Free access to books is, to me, that part of the welfare state that was brought in by the Atlee government as virtually the equivalent of free access to health care. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got to really extol the virtues of it, do everything we can to protect it. What's happened in my area, it's a Tory council, um, we, had a, we had a strike about four, three years ago, which I supported, etc. But what the Tories have done is that they got rid of a lot of the qualified staff, basically, at that level. And they brought in relatively junior and unqualified staff. And now they've gone into, um, well, basically our libraries have got coffee shops as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they bring in staff to serve the coffee. And by the way, would you like a book? That was the <laughs> I'll be campaigning within the Labour Party for us to legally <coughs> recognise the role of libraries and strengthen their protections throughout. We worked, Jeremy and I worked with the Libraries Association, I think it was, before. And we'll renew that. We'll re renew that relationship and bring them in and campaign with them. social movement and an electoral force, um, and really just ask a question about that, about whether, although um, th those two things could be complementary, but also sort of parallel, um, and I want to ask whether actually, well, I'm suggesting that we also want to try and integrate, or at least have them largely overlapping, um, in terms of um, what we want to bring into the Labour Party now, because I think one of the things that we're, we're thinking about with momentum is, although it, brilliant to have a socialist uh, leader of the Labour Party and a socialist shadow chancellor. Um, the Labour Party also needs to be about uh, democracy and accountability, and we need to be using all the structures we have available to us in the Labour yeah. Party, uh, including the link with the unions, in terms of holding all our representatives to account. Um, you know, and that's important in all sorts of ways, um, both in terms of MPs, mm. across our councils, across 
the country and so on. So um, really, uh, I'm just asking a question about mm -hmm. how you see yeah. the, th the sort of things we can do as momentum in terms of um, yeah, bringing that social yeah. movement into the electoral force, into the Labour Party, mm -hmm. and um, really trying to hold our representatives to account. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't count oppose the development of the Labour Party against the social movement. Yeah. It's exactly as you just said. One is complementary to the other. They reinforce each other. Um, and so the idea of building a social movement is actually trying to build that sort of grassroots support that goes on for the ideas and concepts that we're campaigning for, and then translate that into very practical action at the grassroots community level. But that must, that will eventually influence the Labour Party. But I'm, I'm, I tell, I'm very straightforward about this. If you want to protect Jeremy's leadership and my own, join the Labour Party. No, because uh, that's the only we, we can only survive. I don't, I don't say that in any challenging way, and I respect people in other political parties, etc. But to be frank, you know what it's like in the Labour Party. Every vote is important, whether it's at a branch level, GMC level, or Labour Party conference. Every vote is important. Every selection of a candidate is absolutely critical. And if we're going to maintain the, the, the trajectory of, of the Labour Party now as a, as a socialist party, opposed to austerity, etc., we've got to win every battle within the Labour Party. And you only win the battles on the basis of having people turn up at meetings, voice their, their views, garner support, and win the votes. And, the, and I'm, I'm straightforward with people, you know. It's, it's great building up the social movement, that's great, but unless we have the votes from the Labour Party, we will not, for example, win the Trident vote. We will not, for example, win future selections. So it's absolutely key. And I know people don't, sometimes you don't like, you know, Labour Party meetings can be boring as whatever. Uh, you know, it, 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 I can't, I can't emphasise how many council reports you can fall asleep on, that sort of thing, from jumble cell discussions. But actually, people turn up and enliven those meetings and transform them into what they used to be, which was real political debate. And in that way, more and more people turn up. So I, 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 all the time now, I, I thank people for the support. I welcome the campaigning stuff. I welcome the development the participation and the development of our social movement. But I'm literally begging people to join the party because when it comes to it, there will be a few key votes in this next couple of years that we need Labour Party membership support to be voting for. So it's an, it's an act of absolute solidarity to join the party. Janice spoke really well at the weekend, and I've, as, as I said, I, I made it absolutely clear that of my 100% support for my actions in the future. Just on that, because it was raised this issue about the picket line. I went on the picket lines at St Thomas's, and then the following dispute, there was a discussion at Shadow Cabinet, and they were worried about um, Hunt turning this into a sort of political um, stunt. So I went, rather than go on the picket lines, I met with my local junior doctors, we had a meeting, etc. Um, but I made it clear that... Uh, You've got to, the Labour Party at every level now on these disputes has got to show solidarity. And the solidarity has to be shown in the way that those seeking solidarity request it. So if a request comes in to go on a picket line, we should respect that. To give Ed Miliband his due, um, for, the, for the first time in over a decade, he did join picket lines. He went on the UK's care campaign picket line in Doncaster. 
He actually did. John's put his face, but he did. I've got the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I know the issue, though, John. Yeah, um, yeah. And also, he supported the firefighters when they went into their pensions dispute. And again, I've, I was second to the firefighter, FBU yeah. Department Chair, <coughs> and that was a near miracle. So I was trying to persuade the other Shadow Cabinet members that when we have a tradition in this party of support, and we render that support on the basis of what's requested, not we, not what we determine. That will determine our views of people like in the future. We've had um, people expelled from the party for, for spurious reasons over the years. Um, there's a compliance unit. The NEC now, the National Executive Committee of the Labour Party, are looking at that whole exercise, so how we can move <laughs> away from this um, regime which expels people or prevents people joining. Unless there's out, you know, outrageous behaviour, you, you, you've got to allow people to come in. And if we're going to be a democratic party again, we've got to allow a range of views as well. So we've been, I have been speaking here for these expulsions and talking to NEC members, etc. That review will go on. I'm, my view is I'd like to scrap the compliance unit altogether uh, and get back to a situation, well, get back to a situation where people are automatically uh, accepted into membership, unless there's a significant issue that comes up. A lot of the problems that we've had, as well as going back to individual constituency Labour parties, not accepting people because they're consulted as well. And that's another reason why I'm saying to people, join the party at the local level, because actually the local constituency Labour parties have quite a lot of influence about whether people get accepted into membership as well. We've had some real victories coming through as well, because of the new openness and democracy in the party. The, F the FBU reaffiliate is a major breakthrough, basically. Yeah. And you'll see a number of FBU members who in the past have not been members or have not or have been expelled will be coming back into the party as individual members as well. And again, I, I think that will nourish the whole nature of the Labour Party to actually have those people who have been through so many struggles in recent years that have stood firm. That will, I think it will change the culture of the Labour Party and change the relationship and attitude that there is to trade unionism too. Before the last question, just to say that we need to be out there extend. So the price of us staying long is for all of you to uh, help us clear the, the hall. If everyone can just collect the paperwork and from their row and bring it to the front, then we can earn a few, one or two more questions. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, no. Use the mic. Nobody here would underestimate for a moment what we're up against um, and I think a lot about this and I think I try and think about simple ideas that might help mm. one of the things um, with, with the media and how do we you how do we actually reach people lots of people which is what we have to do um, and along with all the other things that talked about, um, I'm wondering if there's any possibility of coming up with a sort of label um, name for the Labour Party now that will make a distinction between the previous Labour Party and this <laughs> new, exciting, wonderful opportunity that we have now that we could use and would make a bit of psycho psychological contact. Thank you very much. For Especially for me. Thank you. There's people down here suggesting the word new labor. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. New, new labor, that won't do. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
10 months effectively. And that is about all these campaigns of solidarity. It's about making sure we organize meetings like this to debate the issues and that we get out there now just on the streets as much as possible. We don't control the media by any means. And so what we've tried to do now is, is use what we can. And, and the one thing that we've got now, which we never had before, which is social media. So we must be much more effective and professional about using that. But also, I have to say, word of mouth has come back again. You know, meeting after meeting around the country are packed out with people turning up to just discuss the issues of concern to them. And I think we've got to broaden that out and give people the opportunities to participate. So I don't want to change the name. I want to be proud of the Labour Party again as a result of what we're doing and the campaigns that we're waging and the principal positions that we're taking. Solidarity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, guys, before I ask you to join me in thanking John, uh, there are two more things. Uh, first, there's a collection. Uh, please put some uh, cash in. Also, stop trying to march on the 27th of February at noon. Please pick up the postcard and a national demonstration. Uh, oh, homes, jobs, education. Saturday, 16th of April. There are flies for everything here. Thank you very much, John, for being here. Okay, thanks, guys, uh, for joining us. Please uh, tweet this out. It's uh, been a long meeting, but uh, very good speakers. Okay, thanks. You keep watching. Up that weren't answered. Yeah. Maybe it would help. Come along to the next momentum briefing on Monday, the 14th of March, here at the university. It would be really well, lots of people, but uh, yeah, I've been preaching to the so converted, much. as they say. But uh, yeah, it's been in interesting. I didn't really want. I didn't really want to come down here, but uh, I was told to do so. But it was uh, and it's some good information. Anyway, thank you for watching. See you later. And please, guys, tweet, keep tweeting this. Send this to everybody. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. Keep watching. Bye.